Hey guys, hello everyone and welcome to the channel. Welcome to a video where we are going to discuss uh, physical chemistry questions from part B of CSINET exam. So I thought to make this video so that we can have a detailed discussion about questions and uh, because this year physical chemistry questions were a little bit on the different side. So I'll be also telling you that which questions were asked from the previous year and how to solve them out, right? So that is going to be the sole motive of this particular video. In case if you have not watched the solutions of uh, aptitude portion then uh, you can uh, watch it from the i button itself and uh, if you guys want to download this uh, question paper that is there the link is there in the description of this video you can check that out all right so i have this question paper and i have marked physical chemistry question of part b as this red star so wherever we will see that we will solve that question okay so i'll start from here which is question id 701051 it says that the character table for the point group D3H is given below. This is the character table given to us and it says in the electronic ground state BF3 has D D3H symmetry. Therefore, so there are four options. First says that a fundamental transition to an A1 dash state is IR active. Then it is asked whether A2 dash is IR active or Raman active. Then A2 double dash is a Raman active or not and E double dash is both IR active as well as Raman active or not. So this was a PYQ. Okay, This was a question from previous year question. If you have solved previous year's question, it would have been very easy for you to solve this particular question. All right. So let's look upon the options one by one. It says a fundamental transition to an A1 dash state is IR active. So let's look upon it. So A1 dash is the state and in order to become IR active, this is the third column. Okay, This is the third column of character table and over here if you have x y or z okay if you have x y or z in that case only we say that it is ir active okay then only we call it as ir active now it is not ir active right a1 dash does not have x y or z here so that's why it is ir inactive so option a is incorrect option b says that a fundamental transition to an a2 dash this is a2 dash so if you look upon this A2 dash, there is no X, Y or Z. So it is IR inactive, right? So it is not IR active. And to look upon Raman active, this is the fourth column. Okay, this is fourth column. Over here, we look for quadratic functions. Okay, so if quadratic function is present, in that case, we call it as Raman active. So here, there is no quadratic function. So that's why it is neither Raman active. There is no X, Y or Z. So that's why it is neither IR active. So option two seems to be the correct option. Let's justify option number three. It says a fundamental transition to A2 double dash state is Raman active. So A2 double dash, see uh, whether it is a Raman active or not. So you don't have any quadratic function here, right? So it is Raman inactive. Okay. So this is again a wrong statement. Statement four says that a fundamental transition to E double dash is both IR active as well as Raman active. So E double dash, there is no X, Y or Z. So it is IR IR inactive, right? And there is no quadratic function here. So it is again Raman inactive, right? So this is again an incorrect statement. So it is, uh, this is also neither IR active, neither Raman active, okay? So now the question is that which one is IR active? So E dash is actually IR active because it has X and Y and uh, A2 double dash is also IR active because it has Z. Uh, which are Raman active. So A1 dash is Raman active because it has quadratic function and also E dash is Raman active because it has quadratic functions. All right. I hope you understood the concept. Let's take the next question. So if we scroll down, uh, we will get this particular question. This question was asked from the concept of uh, so this was a question from data analysis, right? That was the concept of it. It says that consider the following two data set. You have a set A, which has X1, X2, X3, and so on till Xn. And you have another data set that is B and it is lambda X1, lambda X2, lambda X3, and so on, lambda Xn, all right? Now they are telling that xi is independent random variables and lambda is some positive constant. The ratio of standard deviation and the average values of the data set which is rb given by sigma b upon average of b and ra which is uh, sigma a upon uh, average of a. Now let me explain you a few things over here. So let us consider that a is some uh, like we have some numbers. Let's say we have 1, 2, 3, 4, so on we have till 10. Okay. 
and b can be any other number let's say this is uh, uh, 4 8 12 16 and 40 so if you look upon this carefully it will be like this is b okay so this is the b which we have considered this is the a which we have considered so this b actually looks like ki this is a multiple of 4 right if you multiply this whole a with some number lambda which is 4 over here you will get b so that's what they are trying to explain you they are, they are trying to tell you that there is a set and there is another set made by some numbers which are multiple of some constant okay now the what they are asking is what is the ratio of it so you should know this that ratio of standard deviation sd standard deviation and mean or average is called as coefficient of variance okay this is called as coefficient of variance all right so this r b and r a are actually coefficient of variance and on what factor does it depends it depends upon the factor that how much data is like like what is the uh, separation of the data or how much data are moving from the mean position okay so since both are multiple of it so they will not be having a different values that what does that what does that means that coefficient of variance if you have some data points let's say if you have some data points let's say these are some data points so coefficient of variance basically talks about that uh, up to what range these data points are lying okay so let's say if this is representing set a so set b will also be having similar thing the only thing is that because it is multiple of some number some positive number so it will lie little above but the separation of the data points will be same so what does it means it means that the coefficient of variance does not change if you multiply the set with some constant number the only thing will be that uh, its position in the graph might change okay that means its its uh, mean might change okay the the mean value uh, is uh, might change but the coefficient of variance is not going to change actually so that's why option a is correct and it actually depends upon that how much data is like spread out what is the spread out uh, region of the data that's what is going to define coefficient of variance over here all right let's take another question so the next question from physical chemistry or basically data analysis again is over here it says that uh, three measurements of the lead content of a lead oxide nanoparticle of sample yielded 15 point uh, so we have 15.67 milligram uh, 15.69 milligram and 16.03 milligram respectively standard deviation is what they are asking so you should know the formula of standard deviation the formula for standard deviation is under root x minus x bar is square divided by n minus 1 now what is x over here x are the elements or the terms x bar is the mean value n is the number of so n defines the number of observables which we have over here okay so these are your let's say these are your x okay these are your x x bar if you want to calculate that will be mean right so how to calculate mean so mean will be sum of these that is 15.67 plus 15.69 plus 16.03 divide this whole by 3 and if you do that basically you are going to get 15.79 okay so that's the mean value so if i am going doing this x minus x bar that means if i am subtracting so you have a calculator you can directly do because in the exam they were giving you calculator so subtract and square it up so the sub, subtraction will be 0 0.12 and the square of that will be uh, 0 0.0144 again the difference of these two will be 0 0.1 and the square of that will be 0 0.01 uh, the difference of these two will be around 0 0.26 something uh, 24 something and the square of that will be 0 0.0576 okay now we are going to do the sum of them so if you add them sigma okay here also it should be sigma in the formula so the sum of all of them is going to be uh, 47.39 okay sum of x values and sum of these is going to be 0 0.082 so you got the value of this you have the value of n you can put it over here to calculate standard deviation so this will be 0 0.082 divided by 3 minus 1 because you have 3 
um, observables so that will be 2 and so under root 0 0.082 divided by 2 so solve this up and you will get under root 0 0.041 which will give you rough value of 0 0.2024 uh, or roughly it will be 0 0.20 which is option number fourth okay 0 0.20 will be the correct option option for this okay let's see the next question okay this was a direct question they were asking that among the following the correct thermodynamic equation of a state is so, so that should be your statement number two or option number two which is first thermodynamic equation of a state right this is first thermodynamic equation of a state so it was a straightforward question no need to explain anything in, in this let's go to the next question all right this was a good question it was asked that in the jablonski diagram given below the initial excitation takes place from the singlet ground state to the second singlet excited state match the processes to the event marked as abc so let's look upon this so now if you see this uh, the process from here this is a singlet ground state it has went to some singlet second order excited state and then you are coming down in the energy so this is excitation okay or absorbance has caused this transition when this happens this is called as internal conversion uh, in which the energy uh, is lost in the form of vibrational relaxation and all so this is purely from jablonski diagram nothing extra to be discussed over here a is simply inter-system crossing. What happens over here that the spin of the system changes. Okay, spin state changes within excited levels. Okay, so that means you don't, you are not coming to the ground state. You are in the excited state itself, but the spin has changed. So you have changed from the singlet to the triplet state. That's why it is an inter-system crossing. Now B is again a fluorescence now why b is fluorescence see because you have changed the energy or, or there is energy loss over here within the uh, process where the um, where there is no loss of uh, sorry no change in spin so loss of energy yeah emission you can say it not loss of energy let's call it as emission so emission without without changing spin is known as um, yeah that is basically is known as fluorescence okay so this is fluorescence what about c so c is phosphorescence why is it phosphorescence because this is emission with change in spin so the spin has changed over here and emission has happened so that's why this is phosphorescence okay phosphorescence so that's why option number d becomes correct choice for this okay let's get a little down to the next question okay the next question is from quantum chemistry it was pretty easy question i would say the question says that two energy levels which has nx1 and ny6 nx3 and ny2 uh, is a particle in two dimensional rectangular box of side lx and ly and lx has value 1 ly is what they are trying to ask you and it is a degenerate energy level that means energy of uh, where nx is 1 and ny is 6 is equals to energy of a state where nx is 3 and ny is 2 we know that energy of a state e uh, of 2d box is equals to h square upon 8m in the bracket we have nx square upon lx square plus ny square upon ly square right we can substitute the values for both the sides so for this one we will be having h square upon 8m in the bracket we will be having 1 square divided by lx lx is 1 so let's directly put its value so yeah this will be 1 square and plus this will be 6 square divided by ly square uh, on the other side again you will be having h square upon 8m in the bracket you will be having 3 square upon 1 square plus 2 square upon ly square all right 
so this term is going to get cancelled out same terms on both the sides this will become 1 plus 36 upon ly square is equals to this is going to become 9 plus 4 upon ly square now you have to basically solve it um, what you are going to do is this will be ly square plus 36 is equals to 9 ly square plus 4 uh, in both the sides in denominator ly square will remain that can be simply cancelled out and now when you solve this up so this is going to become 8 ly is equals to 32 ly square or ly is equals to 4 sorry ly square is equals to 4 or ly is equals to under root 4 which is plus minus 2 or basically it cannot have a negative value these are energy levels or oh, sorry these are length so length cannot be negative that's why option number a which is 2 is going to be the correct choice for this all right so let's take the next question okay so the next question from physical chemistry is here okay nuclear chemistry question id 1032 over here it says in the fusion reaction the reaction is given below for the given masses masses are given to you for all the elements one amu is also given to you how much mega electron volt per c square it is the energy released is it is very very simple question all you have to do is find out delta m which is mass of uh, uh, like reactant minus mass of product or mass of product minus reactant you can do anyone okay whatever is bigger you can subtract that that's what you have to do just the difference of both of them it doesn't matter if you do mass reactant or mass product okay whatever you are subtracting whatever is bigger you have to subtract it a smaller one has to be subtracted from the bigger one that's all that's what you have to do you have to put the values okay uh, so if i am doing mass of product minus mass of reactant so i have to do like the mass of product which is barium so it is 139.9106 plus okay so uh, then we have krypton which is 92.9313 and plus we have three neutrons so it will be 3 into 1.0086 okay this is mass of product minus mass of reactant will be uranium that is 235.0439 and plus one neutron which is 1.00867 okay on solving this i should get my delta m value which will come up to 0 0.18466 amu i have to convert it in mega electron volts it's pretty simple basically delta m is equals to uh, i just have to multiply it with one zero point one eight four double six into nine thirty one point four nine four mega electron volt on solving using the calculator you will get a value near to 172 mega electron volt so that will be your correct answer i hope you understood let's take the next question now okay the next one is pretty easy one what it says that uh, the change in entropy and the gibbs free energy for the system are denoted by delta g and delta s respectively for reversible melting of ice at 1 atm and 0 degree celsius remember what happens at 1 atm pressure and 0 degree celsius your ice and water are in equilibrium and wherever you have at equilibrium your delta g is zero over there right so that makes option a and option d incorrect what about entropy so of course if the ice is melting entropy should increase right entropy should be greater than zero so that's why option number b becomes correct choice easy one let's take next one okay this was a very easy one it was asked that given that pka1 and pka2 are the values uh, for alanine these values are given to you they were asking what isoelectronic point or isoelectric point so isoelectric point formula is very simple if you would have just done a guess also you might have got a correct answer the average of pka values is the isoelectric point so that is 2.34 plus 9.68 divide this by 2 and you will get 6.01 which is option number a easy right let's take the next question now 
Okay, now this was a good question from quantum chemistry. It says the following plot schematically show the variation of two molecular orbitals which are psi1 and psi2 along the internuclear axis of the linear triatomic molecule A to B. Fine. If the atomic orbital corresponding to atoms A and B are, are represented by phi A and phi B, the molecular orbitals psi1 and psi2 have the form. Okay, so to do this type of question, first thing is to look upon the sign of it. So for psi1, you have three things, right? You have uh, like three wave functions, like it will be like phi A, phi B, phi A, okay? So what is the sign over here? See, it's on the positive side, plus, plus and plus, all of them are positive, right? And what about psi2? So it should be phi A, phi B, the sign should be plus minus and plus so it is plus minus and plus that's all you have to do to get the answer okay and that will take you to the correct answer which is option number b that's all you don't have to look upon the other things okay one confusion which you might be having which they also tried to confuse you with was uh, by changing the coefficients okay here you have coefficient a b a here you have coefficient a b and c now let's understand what coefficients actually tell you coefficients tells us about the height okay about the height that's what the coefficients are telling you now since these two heights are same so the coefficients corresponding to them should also be same so if this is a1 this should also be a1 okay similarly here also the heights are same sign is also same so if this is a2 this also should be a2 right so that makes your correct option understood okay let's take the next question then fine this was i think the easiest question in the whole paper it was that if a x b y crystallizes in fcc lattice um, with atom a occupying every corner and atom b occupying the center of each face center of the unit cell the correct stoichiometry is pretty simple corner atoms okay corner corner atom contributes 1 by 8 and face centered contributes 1 by 2. Now, since you have 8 corners, so contribution of contrib or you can write down uh, A per unit cell, okay, number of number of A per unit cell. So, per unit cell A is occupying every corner of it. So, 1 by 8 and since you have 8 corners, so you have just 1 A and number of, uh, so 1 A, okay, a number of B per unit cell. So, for that so you have contribution 1 by 2, you have 6 faces, so it should be 3 B, okay. So, the formula will come up A B 3, which is option number first, easy one, right. Okay, let's take the next question. Okay, so this was a good question from electrochemistry. This I think was easy also. Many of you might have done it very correctly, but uh, some people might got confused with it. Okay, so I'll, I'll explain you how to do this. It says that at 298 Kelvin, a zinc electrode is submerged in an acidic 0.9 molar zinc solution, which is connected to a salt bridge of 0.3 molar silver solution okay containing a silver electrode given that zinc oxidizes or the oxidation potential of zinc is 0.76 volt and uh, the oxidation potential of uh, silver is minus 0.80 volt versus a standard hydrogen electrode uh, so they are asking the initial voltage of the cell is how much okay so let's try to solve this up so in order to solve this question, first thing which you have to understand is that uh, zinc, okay, uh, yeah, zinc is better reducing agent, okay, it is better reducing agent than silver. So that means zinc can reduce silver easily, okay, because in the electrochemical series zinc is above silver, right? So, that means zinc will undergo self-oxidation, okay. 
so this will undergo self oxidation right so that means what will happen in the reaction that zinc will convert in zinc plus 2 and it will remove two electrons whereas uh, silver is going to get reduced because zinc is there so the zinc will reduce it so basically what is happening that in the solution you have zinc solution and you are attaching it with salt bridge so both of them will also interact with each other right so that's why this reduction of silver is happening so silver is plus ion it will take up one electron and it will reduce to give silver solid now to balance this out you have to multiply with two everywhere in this so i have multiplying with it and i can write down overall cell reaction so when i write down overall cell reaction I will have zinc plus 2 moles of silver plus should give us zinc plus 2 and along with that we should have 2 moles of silver solid. Now I have to just write down Nernst equation. Okay. Now before going into that let me also write down the E naught of the cell. Okay. So E naught of cell is E reduction minus E oxidation. Now you might have understood who is going to undergo reduction. So the reduction of silver is happening so I will just write down uh, the uh, the potential of it that is minus 0 0.80 and minus and I will just now write down the oxidation like E of oxidation of it okay so the value over here is 0 0.76 oxidation potential of it so so the idea is that your both these values should be in the reduction potential so the correct way is that only that you should write down the values in reduction potential but eventually they will convert into the same value right so actually you should write down it as uh, so in order to convert this uh, into reduction potential this should have been uh, plus a 0 0.80 volt and minus 0 0.76 that should be the correct way okay so why I have done that because these values in this formula should always be kept in the form of reduction potential. So I have converted these are oxidation potentials I have converted into reduction potential. This will be 0 0.80 plus 0 0.76 which will give us 1.56 okay. So 1.56 is the E naught of cell. Now I will use Nernst equation which says that E of cell is equals to E naught of cell minus 0 0.059 upon N then log concentration of product which is zinc plus 2 okay why silver is not written because it is in the solid form so its concentration will be 1 same goes for zinc okay so here I will be having silver Ag plus and square of that because of this coefficient now I will put the value of their concentrations and I will solve so this is 1.56 okay um, minus 0 0.059 upon n value will be 2 because on balancing it we got 2 then log concentration of zinc ion is 0 0.9 molar so 0 0.9 molar divided by 0 0.3 molar square of that okay so this will be 1.56 minus if you solve this 0 0.059 upon 2 this will be log 9 upon sorry 0 0.9 upon 0 0.09 on solving this we will get log 10 which will be 1 and this will come up 1.56 minus 0 0.0295 which will give you eventually 1.5305 that's your option number 4 okay so this was the last question from physical chemistry in part b so in this video we have done all the questions of uh, physical chemistry we have done okay so physical chemistry part b we have done right so do let me know in the comment sections if you guys want me to make another part in which i should solve the inorganic questions as well and uh, yeah so do let me know in the comment section if you want that and if you want the solution of part c as well please do let me know in the comment section if i will get sufficient numbers of likes and views I will definitely make a video on the other parts as well. Alright. So that's it for this video guys. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you understood. I hope the concepts are clear to you. The part B was pretty simple especially from the physical chemistry. One or two questions were little tricky but they were also easy to be done. Right. I hope you understood everything. I will see you guys in the next one. Till then have a great day. Bye bye. Take care. Hello everyone. So here is an announcement regarding upcoming batch for CSI net exam. 
So, the next batch for the next session that is for December session of 2023, we have launched a new course that is going to be a detailed course on organic and inorganic spectroscopy. This course is a part of the next batch and this batch is starting from 19th of June. All right. So, we are starting our classes from 19th of June and these are the topics uh, which you can find out uh, regarding the uh, like regarding this particular course and all you have to do in order to attend these classes you all have to do is take an academy plus subscription okay now um like once you take an academy plus subscription what you are going to get first of all you will get access to all the live classes you can attend all these classes live secondly you get access to recorded sessions as well that means once the class ends you get the recording of the session third you also get access to mock test previous years questions and fourth you that is most important thing is that you get access to a doubt session that means after every if you see after every four classes we have a doubt clearing session after every four classes means every week we have a doubt clearing session and that doubt clearing session is a live session where you can ask your doubt you can discuss the questions with the educator and uh, like that will be a live session so these are the benefits of taking uh, an academy plus subscription so in order to join an academy plus all you have to do is take an academy plus subscription these are the charges of the subscription or the subscription fees this is a charge for six month subscription this is a 12 month subscription charge all you have to do is you have to use my referral code that is an underscore huda in order to avail this discounted price for the subscription and make sure that you take subscription before 17th of june so that you get the access of it and you can join the classes live